Good morning and welcome to worship with us at Adventure. I invite you to stand and join us as we start our service off this morning, singing our praises to God with This Is The Day. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now my joy awaits oh, my praise. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I am grateful. was down you brought me out and set my feet on higher ground so here i stand you are my god your faithfulness my solid rock i give thanks for all you have done and i will sing of your today you know um, I just had a couple experiences last week just kind of interesting just driving in my car I was coming up towards the church and I saw a young woman in her car uh, and her she had a, a toddler in a car seat and she was just in tears she was sobbing and it just there was just so much pain in her face and, she, and I just thought I just was trying to imagine what is going on in her life today and, you know, it's just, I wanted to pull over, get her to pull over so I could give her a hug or invite her to mops or do something. <laughs> Yesterday I was over at Fred Meyer and I was walking by a, a, a truck up near the front and there was a, a young man in the front and he had a little piece of foil and a lighter and clearly was, was smoking meth or something along those lines. And I thought, my heart just broke for him because I thought, oh, you know, how did you get to this point? You used to, I'm sure at some point you were somebody's little boy. There is such a great need in our lives for Jesus. And we're here. So we're kind of going the right direction, but I just, I hope that all of us, those, both those things just reminded me how much we need to reach out to our community to teach the people around us about God's love for us, people that are dealing with addiction, people that are, that are just 
so lost they just are in tears driving down the road. So I just hope that this morning as we, as we worship that we uh, think not only about ourselves and our relationship with God, but, but our community and how we can draw others into a relationship with God. Let's continue the, to worship this morning. Just sing of God's reckless love.
check out Life Adventure this morning. Good morning, adventure. You never know what's going to happen around here, I tell you. You don't want to miss a day. Good to see each of you. Welcome. Always great to gather together to focus on Jesus, what God has done for us, for the redemption and the grace that God has given to us, and that's why we're gathered together. We're glad that you're here. If you're here for the first time, a special welcome. We hope you'll stop by the Welcome Center and um, ask for the packet or uh, I think there's a gift right there's something special at the welcome center yeah what's free in that gift a free, a free latte can't beat that okay so um, uh, and introduce yourself stay for refreshments we'd love to meet you we're glad that you're here just one thing in addition to the announcements that we need to make sure you understand and hear if you're a member of the church next Sunday between services so right at about 10 o'clock is the annual election meeting of our congregation okay that's when we elect our new elders and deacons and members of the nominating committee so next sunday we're asking all members to be present at 10 o'clock for you it's simple you just stay after for the 11 o'clock members it's a major sacrifice to get here at 10 okay but we'll we'll hope that they'll they'll make it so that's next sunday Okay, the election meeting of the congregation. Um, right now, we're going to welcome some new members into our church. If those new members would come forward at this time. And um, it's just been a, a privilege to meet with the class, to meet these uh, wonderful people. 
uh, to welcome them uh, into the life of our church. I think most of them are here. One or two had to be away today. If you guys just want to go ahead and move all the way down. And thank you, Andrea. Ooh. And um, the names of our new members are listed on the back of your bulletin, if you, uh, under, underneath the notes section. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves by name so that you can connect a name with a face, okay? That's the basic idea. So we'll start with uh, Heidi. Hi, I'm Heidi Dialhoff. I'm Ivan Dialhoff. This is Jackie Dialhoff. Wait a minute. I just want everybody to see these incredible blue eyes of Jackie. Can you, do they sparkle all the way out there? Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, you want to eat the microphone too. Okay. Hi, I'm Norma Gregory. I'm Julie Kersey. My name is Annika Cruz. I'm Jesse McCord Fry. Thank you. And Anisha could not be here today. She's out of town on, uh, for her job. But we're so glad that all of you are here and welcome. Let me give this back so we can use our hands. Welcome and thank you for your willingness to be a part of our church family, for um, coming to the class last week, for what we know God is going to do in and through you as you participate in the life of our church. So let me ask the important question, which is, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. And you desire to serve him as your Lord? Yes. And to the congregation, do you welcome these new members as brothers and sisters in Christ and promise to nurture them and serve with them and pray for them and be partners in this great mission that we have of faith? If you do, please say, we do. We do. Well, let's... Um, uh, move to the next step, which is that one of our new members is here to be baptized today. And that's uh, Julie. Julie, if you would come forward just a step here. Um, baptism is a sign and a seal of God's love and God's faithfulness. It reminds us that our sins are washed away. It reminds us that we belong to God. And it's um, just an incredibly, you know, meaningful thing and many many of you have been baptized Martin Luther used to say when he was involved in all kinds of crazy things he would stand up and kind of get stubborn and he would say I am baptized and many of you can say I am baptized it means that I belong to it's, God has given me the sign that I belong to him and so Julie we ask again if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior? And do you place your trust in Him as your Lord? Then, in obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, Julie, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And Julie, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism, and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Julie, for her profession of faith, for this wonderful sign that you have given to her and to all of us that we belong to you. Thank you for each of our new members. May they not be new members for long, but simply brothers and sisters in Christ working toward a common goal of reaching others for Jesus. Help them to grow in their faith, in their walk with you, their understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And help us all to be involved in that process that we might better serve you and know and realize your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, during greeting time today, I'm going to ask our kids to come forward because the they're going to sing. The kids choir, not rest of the kids. kids, the kids' choir, I should say. The rest of the kids, we're going to wait until after the choir sings and then head downstairs for class. And during greeting time, let's see how many people can greet how many new members in the next two minutes, okay? <laughs> All right. So let's stand and greet, greet each other. Thank you, new members, and welcome. We'll let people greet you. Yeah.
Please be seated. Thank you. Our Adventure Kids Troop meets on Wednesdays uh, at 4.30 before uh, base camp, and uh, they put together a little choir thing here. You might, it's a great song for them. They're going to be helped out by some of the adults. But the interesting, that, interesting thing about this song is it was written by our own Don Dilly, okay? Yeah. We call him Beethoven Dilly, you know, just for fun. But it's called, Wherever I Go, Lord.
pray together. God, we come to you this morning, um, raising our hallelujah, praising you, because we know that you control the wind and you control the waves, that whatever it is that, um, that we're going through right now, God, that you are the Lord of that as well. Um, this morning as we are bringing our offerings to you, I pray that we can have a, a spirit of, of thanksgiving for all of the gifts that you brought into our lives and that we can gratefully give back a portion of that. And Lord, I pray that you will bless what we gave this morning, that we can use that um, to reach out to our community, to spread your love in right here in Port Orchard and as far as we're able to reach, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. family grow stick with me today. How many of you have a grow stick on your family? Okay. Uh, a grow stick is just a tool for measuring people. Okay. Some people have a really fancy one like this. Some people just tape up some stuff on the back of their door or they use a, a you know, a marker or something. There are lots of different kind of grow sticks, but I need a couple of volunteers to see if this one works. One, two. Okay. Sisters, we'll see who is taller. Well, obviously me. Obviously you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here, turn, look that way. Hey. Hmm. Do you want to know? Yes. You do? Yeah. Four feet nine. Really? Yeah. Is that an improvement over last time? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. How about Julia? Okay. Okay. Ooh, do you want to know? Yeah. Five feet one half inch. <laughs> okay, now wait a minute. Here's the ironic part. How old are you, Jessica? Twelve. How old are you, Julia? Eleven. Eleven. Twelve. Okay. There's real dynamics in this family, I tell you. Thank you, girls. Uh, I, think the, I think the grow stick works. Yeah. You know, some people keep track of their children from the time they're born, and every year, and we do that at our house, every year on their birthday, we would measure the kids and put a little mark on the grow stick, and... Uh, you know, parents are interested in how fast their kids grow. Uh, it's important for us to grow. Uh, you know, if you don't grow, something is terribly wrong. Let's see where I put that. There we go. Um, some people grow faster than others, but everybody needs to grow. And I've listed on your outline one of Foreman's basic rules of life, which is grow or die. Okay? I mean, you think about it. Anything that's living has to either grow or die. You're either growing or you're dying. When you're real little, you grow a lot physically. And you're also growing mentally, okay? When you get older, you start growing in wisdom, okay? Some of you say, well, I stopped growing, oh, I stopped growing a long time ago. No, you didn't. You're still growing old, okay? And, and when you stop growing, you die. Now, we know this is true in a church. We either grow or we die. There's no such thing as standing still. And that's why it's important for Christians to reach out to new people and welcome them into the church family because the church either has to grow or die. This principle is also true for individual Christians. We either have to grow in our faith and our Christian maturity or we die. And the Bible teaches that becoming a Christian is a lot like becoming a person. First you have to be born, and then you have to grow. Jesus said you must be born again. That means you need to be born spiritually. And my number one goal, and I believe it's the number one goal of our church, 
is to help people to be spiritually born. Another, another way to say that is to help people make a life-transforming connection with Jesus, a connection that changes your life. And we want people who've never done so to realize that they belong to God and to commit their lives to God and to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And when that happens, we know that people's lives are changed. They're turned around. They have a new reason and a new power for living. Now, when a new baby is born, it has to grow. And when a new Christian is born, he or she has to grow in faith to begin the process of maturing as a Christian. And that's the second major goal of our church, to help believers grow in their faith and in their commitment to Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what happened in the early church. In Acts 14, we read about, they helped the believers to grow in love for God and for each other. So everything we do in our church, adventure kids, base camp, worship, trek, life groups, mission program, they're all designed to either help people make a life-transforming connection with Jesus or to help believers grow in their love for God and for each other. And there's a side benefit for the whole church. The Bible teaches that when Christians are growing, the church will grow. Look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 10. We hope that as your faith continues to grow, you will help our work to grow much larger. It's just a natural outcome. As faith grows in people, they reach out to others and work with others to help build the church and expand its ministry so we can reach out to still others. When Christians are growing, the church is growing. Now we have a problem. We run into this all the time. How do we measure Christian growth? How do we measure? I've always admired carpenters. Okay? People who work in the building trade. You know why? Because they can see and they can measure their progress. When you build a house, you can see it going up. You can tell that progress is being made. You know when the job is finished. And you can stand back and say, I did it! Right? In the early days of my ministry, I was so frustrated because in ministry, it's very hard to measure progress. How can I really know if people are growing in their faith and in their love for each other? I may see evidence of Christian growth or Christian maturity here or there, but how can I really get an accurate measurement of how well people are growing? What, are, what, what we need is a Christian grow stick. Okay? How can we measure Christian growth? And I know some things that won't work. Okay? Church membership, for example. I, I love it when membership and attendance are going up. Sometimes that's the sign of a healthy church, but it's not a very accurate indicator of how people in the church are growing in their faith. Well, what about church offerings? Okay, if, if the offerings are growing, does that mean the people are growing? Not necessarily. You can have one person who's really growing and really giving and raising the whole average while everybody else is going along for the ride. Okay? That doesn't tell me whether people are really going growing. How can I tell if, if, if I'm growing as a Christian? Can I rely on how I feel? I know lots of people who get themselves, you know, pumped up into emotional frenzy, and they think they're high on Jesus, but they're really high on adrenaline, okay? How, how I feel about my faith, how I feel when I worship, is not an accurate measure of whether I'm growing as a Christian. Or what about how good I am? Could I, could I get measured in that way, you know? Is that a measure of my faith? The Bible says I can never be good enough for God. Never. And even the most faithful person blows it sometimes. In fact, if I based my faith on how good I am, then I don't have a Christian understanding of what faith is or who Jesus is. Okay? So I think that you as a Christian, and I as a pastor, we are in desperate need of a Christian grow stick. We need something that will help us measure how strong we're getting, how fast we're growing, how mature we're becoming in our Christian faith. And so we're going to spend the next several weeks building this Christian grow stick. And I'm calling this series The Five Next Steps to Christian Maturity. 
Okay? One of the themes of our church, if you've been around for a while, you know this, is that Christians should always be taking a next step. You can find information about a lot of next steps in, on our website. Okay? But Christians should also always be encouraging others to take a next step. And I, one time, a couple of years ago, I encouraged you to just greet each other with, what's your next step? Nobody took me up on that. <laughs> okay? But it's a great question. It's a great question. Christians should always be encouraging each other to take a next step. So some of you have taken these steps that we're going to look at, some of them, or all of them maybe. And I hope this series will give you some tools to help you encourage others to take a next step. Because we all should always be taking a next step and encouraging others to take a next step. And the five steps we're going to look at over the next five weeks are like five lines on a grow stick where we can measure ourselves and see how we're doing, how much progress we're making in our life, in our faith adventure. And you may be doing real well in some of these areas. You may be a miserable failure in some of these areas. But these are the things, some of the things, that God says measure our rate of growth and our maturity as Christians. So we're going to go into each one of these five steps in great detail over the next few weeks, but today it's just kind of an introduction to each one. You can fill in your outline, you know, take it home, start thinking about how you measure up to the five steps of Christian maturity. So step number one, for lack of any better term, we'll call it grace. Grace. And for each of the five steps, I've listed a question on your outline which you can ask yourself. And you can even score yourself, you know, like 1 to 10 or whatever, okay? And the question for this first step, grace, is do I understand and can I explain the good news that God has saved me through Jesus Christ? Do I understand it? Does it make sense? Okay. Could I explain it to somebody else if they said, tell me, what, what is grace all about? Okay. Do I understand it? Can I explain it? 1 Corinthians 15 says, But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out such kindness and grace upon me. He's saying that my status as a Christian, the fact that I've made a life-transforming connection with Jesus Christ, is the result of God lavishing me with grace. I couldn't earn it. I couldn't buy it. There's nothing I can do to make myself right with God. The only way I become a child of God is because God reaches out in love and grace and chooses to see me through the perfection and through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus. And when I begin to understand that God has done everything necessary to save me through Jesus Christ, then I'm beginning to understand God's grace. Now, what is grace? There's a little acrostic that's been around for a million years. You might want to write this down. Grace is God's redemption at Christ's expense. God's redemption at Christ's expense. Ephesians 2.8. Paul says, I mean that you have been saved by grace through believing. You did not save yourselves. It was a gift from God. It was not the result of your own efforts. So you cannot brag about it. God has made us what we are. Okay? To be able to understand and to share God's grace is really the first step toward Christian maturity. It's the ability to know that my basic nature is in rebellion from God. That my relationship with God has been broken. That God loves me so much that he sent his son Jesus to restore that broken relationship through his sacrifice on the cross. And that God has adopted me as his child and he only requires that I freely accept what he's done. And now my relationship with God has been restored and growing more perfect, and I'm going to spend eternity growing in that relationship with God. That's God's grace at work. That's the first step, first next step that you can take or that you can encourage others to take. The second next step toward Christian maturity 
is growth. Once you know the basics of God's grace, it's helpful to discover at a deeper level what it means to have faith, to love God, to love people, to obey God, to serve God, to grow in your following Jesus Christ. And the question to ask here is, am I feeding my faith by spending time with God? Am I feeding my faith by spending time with God? Have you ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? It's partly true, okay? If it was totally true, I would be an M&M. &M. But anyway, <laughs> what, what's true in the physical world is also true in the spiritual world, okay? Your condition is based on your nutrition. Look at this verse from 2 Corinthians 2. Let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. See that you go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the faith you were taught. Let your, love, your lives overflow with joy and thanksgiving for all he has done. See, in order for your body to grow, you need food. You need nourishment. And in order for your faith to grow, you need spiritual food. Where do you get it? Well, 2 Corinthians 2 again says, we grow only as we get our nourishment and strength from God. God is the source of our nourishment. We have to spend time with God in order to grow as Christians. Well, how do we do that? Well, the most obvious ways are through prayer and through studying God's Word. Jesus said that I should pray, okay? In fact, Luke 18, then Jesus used this story that he had just told to teach his followers that they should always pray and never lose hope. You might want to circle that word always in your Bible or on your outline, okay? Not just at bedtime, not just before dinner, not just in church, okay? Jesus said that his followers should always pray. You say, well, sooner or later, I'd run out of things to pray about. <laughs> well, then you need to remember that prayer is a two-way street, okay? If you don't have anything to say to God, then shut up and listen. Because God probably has something to say to you. And what we're talking about here is maintaining communication, keeping the line open, always being aware of the presence of God in your life. Another way that God communicates with a Christian is through Bible study. The Bible is God's written word to you. It's the revelation of God's work throughout history. The Bible is God's love letter to you. And it's basically worthless and communicate nothing unless you read it. In fact, if you want to know the secrets of success, look at this verse from John. Always remember what is written in the book of teachings. Study it day and night to be sure to obey everything that is written there. If you do this, you will be wise and successful in everything. From Joshua, I should say, 1.8. The Bible is an incredible manual for living. <clears throat> and the problem is most people have spent exponentially more time surfing around on Facebook than they've ever spent reading God's Word. Everybody who's guilty, no, never mind, never mind. <laughs> But no wonder we live in such a negative, pessimistic, hopeless society. Romans 15, 4 says, Everything that was written in the past is written to teach us. The Scriptures give us patience and encouragement so that we can have hope. The only way we can grow in patience and encouragement and hope and faith is to spend time with God. Okay? Prayer, Bible study, worship, praise, whatever it takes. God is the source of our nutrition. If we want to grow, we need to spend time with God. The third next step, okay, which some of you have taken, some of you need to encourage others to take, is groups. Might as well stick with G's, okay? Groups. It's not enough to understand God's grace and feed my faith through prayer and Bible study. God says that another stage of Christian maturity is to be in fellowship with other Christians, to be in faith-based relationships with other people. Hebrews 10.25 says, you should not stay away from the church meetings, as some are doing, but should meet together and encourage each other. 
And the question you can ask yourself here is, am I meeting regularly with other Christians to share my life, study God's Word, and pray? Okay? Give yourself a score. Right? One to ten. Now there's a code name for this kind of covert action in our church. Okay? It's called life groups. Small groups have become very popular in the last couple of decades. We have several in our church. And if you're part of a small group, you know, I, I know I am. I'm part of a small group of pastors that meets together regularly. And I can tell you from experience the kind of support and encouragement that you can get from other Christians can really accelerate your growth as a Christian. It can keep you on track. Some people meet for lunch with other Christians at work. Some people make a Sunday morning class their small group experience. Others work with a group of people to accomplish a task in ministry. However you do it, God says you need other people to help you grow in your Christian faith and in your walk. Okay? And in fact, getting together with other Christians is so important that Jesus promised to join in. Jesus said these words, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I with them. And we'll have a lot more to say about life groups later on. Okay, but please understand that growing as a Christian is not an individual event. Every Christian needs support. Okay? Even Batman had Robin. Okay? You're stunting your growth if you're not involved with other Christians in a caring, sharing way. Okay, step, next step, number four, is gifts. And we're talking about spiritual gifts. What are spiritual gifts? Well, the Bible says that we all have different gifts, each of which came because of the grace that God gave us. It all goes back to grace, okay? But he's saying that God has given us all different gifts, certain abilities, or talents, or insights, or capabilities. And God gives these gifts to us right along with the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. When God saved you, He also equipped you with your own unique gift or set of gifts to use in your life for Him. 1 Corinthians 7 says, Each person has his own gift from God. One has one gift, another has another gift. And in uh, chapter 14, he says, it's the same with you. Since you want spiritual gifts very much, seek most of all to have the gifts that help the church grow stronger. So what's the purpose of spiritual gifts? The purpose is to help the church grow stronger. If you're a Christian, God has given you the equipment to help build the church and make it stronger. You know, if I was in baseball, I wouldn't send a hitter to the plate without giving him a bat. Okay? God doesn't send you to work in the church without giving you the tools and the equipment that you need. The gifts that you need to help the church grow stronger. And if you're rating yourself, the question for this next step of Christian maturity is, am I using my God-given gifts to help my church? Some of you may not have any idea what your gifts are. And in a few weeks, we're going to just take a, a detailed look at spiritual gifts and try to help you discover how you can use your unique abilities that God has given you to help your church. Okay. Oh, and by the way, one of the most common ways you can discover your, your gifts is by using them. I've known people who said, I can't teach. I don't know how. And somehow they got roped into teaching a class and discovered that their gift was I knew one guy who was an incredible teacher, but he never knew that until he tried. And so just let me encourage you, okay, try a lot of things. When you see a need in the church, jump in. You might just stumble over a gift that you didn't even know you had. Okay? And the fifth step, and again, these five steps are, you know, there are many, many more steps that we can take, next steps in our faith. But the fifth next step we're going to talk about is called good stewardship. 
And many people consider this to be the acid test of Christian maturity and growth. And it's also the easiest one to give yourself a score on. Okay, the question is, am I giving cheerfully and generously as an expression of my love for God? Now, how do I measure that? Well, you know, the Old Testament teaches over and over again that the tithe, or one tenth of my income, is a sign of real commitment and faith. So this one's easy to score, right? If you're a tither, give yourself to 10. If you give 5% of your income, give yourself a 5. 2%, give yourself a 2. If you take money out of the offering plate when it goes by, give yourself a minus 1. Okay? But today, in New Testament times, we understand that God doesn't require us to give 10%. God requires us to give everything. Everything. All of life, all our time, all our gifts, all our resources are gifts from God, and they belong to God. And the question we have to answer is, how do I use what God has given me to serve Him and serve others? God says that your giving reveals your maturity as a Christian. In fact, look at this verse. It is proof of your faith. Many people will praise God because you obey the good news of Christ, the gospel you say you believe, and because you freely share with them and with all others. So when you give generously, you not only show your love for God, you show your faith in God. A, t a tither says, God, I'm going to use one-tenth of my income. I'm going to give it back to you. And I have faith that you're going to enable me to live on the other nine-tenths that you've given me. And it was all yours in the first place, Lord, so thank you for letting me use 90% of it. Okay? That takes faith. And the amazing thing is what God does in the lives of people who have that kind of faith. Luke 6, 38, Jesus said, Give, and you will receive. You will be given much. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will spill into your lap. The way you give to others is the way God will give to you. So one of the surest signs of Christian growth and maturity is when we're able to reject the tyranny of money and freely share what God has given to us. And we're going to go into great more detail about this in a few weeks, okay? But today, kind of an introduction, the five next steps to Christian maturity. Grace, growth, group, gifts, and good stewardship. And these are five ways that we can look at our own faith adventure and determine how well we're doing, how much progress we're making. And each of them is an indication of our willingness to let God work in us and let God work through us. When God works in our lives, we grow. And we become more conformed to the character of Christ. So I hope you'll think about your next step. And especially about grace. Okay? Grace is something that even people who've been Christians for their whole lives struggle with. How do I believe it? How do I accept it? How do I receive it? How do I explain it? How do I share what it is with other people. But it's the first stage of Christian growth. If you haven't made a life-transforming connection with Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that today, to, to simply believe that God loves you, that Jesus died for you, that God is ready to help you grow in your relationship with Him. And next week, again, we're going to go into this in much more detail, and next week's topic will be grace, okay? God's redemption at Christ's expense. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your amazing grace, and we thank you that you did not put us here just to be stagnant, to never grow in our faith, but you placed us here to constantly grow, to constantly become more like Christ, to conform to the character of Christ, to become ready for heaven. And I pray that you'll help us in that endeavor, that we might better understand your love, your forgiveness, your grace, that we might be better equipped to serve you with our lives. We lift these prayers to you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes and see that you're changing my life. All I am, I surrender. Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me. All I am, I surrender. To trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me, and my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. Because I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me, and my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. Give me to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my Now may grace, love, and peace from God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and remain with you now and forever. Amen.